ICQ Podcast episode 248, trying 60 metres with the Sota Bean Bandhopper antenna. Well, hello fellow Amateur Radio enthusiasts and welcome to this, our 248th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio podcast, supported by our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, I'm joined by Leslie Butterfield, Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Edmund Spicer, Mike Zero, Mike November Golf, Bill Bynes, November 3, Julia India X-Ray, and Martin Rothwell, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lean, to discuss the latest Amateur Radio news. And also our feature in this episode is Trying 60 Meters with the Sota Beam Bandhopper Antenna, as presented by Martin M1MRB. Well, as always, we'd like to thank our donors for helping us keep us advert free and paying our way and our hosting costs, etc. And it's uh, those subscription donors that we're thanking this episode. Uh, and unfortunately, no one off donors this episode. But uh, we'd like you to consider us uh, by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate, where anything you can send our way is always greatly appreciated. Well, now I'm joined by Martin, Edmund, Bill and Leslie to discuss the latest Amazon radio news, including VDSL interference and would you buy a .com radio domain name? Hope you enjoy. Well, everybody, we've got a slightly different voice here chairing the news roundtable this episode as we're giving Martin the uh, the week off. Uh, so I'm joined by this week's news panel. And first off, we're joined by the gentleman that uh, I think... If I'm the supply teacher covering the, the main teacher, and this is the gentleman I think that's sitting at the front of the class, and say coming up with very wise, interesting uh, suggestions, Mr. Edmund Spicer, Mike Zero, Mike November Golf. Edmund, uh, welcome to the episode. Hope you're well. Oh, blow me. I thought you were going to say somebody other than me saying that. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm the one who crouches at the back and tries to look invisible. Oh, no, no, you're fine. I, I have this impression you're at the front of the class working hard on a great answer. So there you go. Now, as, you, as you've all. You've never met me, have you? No, no, no. But you, 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 you sell it well on, the, on audio. Now, of course, every school should have a foreign exchange student bringing away uh, you know, wonderful insights into, into cultures that we don't understand. So to cover that role, we have Bill Barnes, November 3, Juliet India X ray. Bill, good evening to you. I hope you're well. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and then, uh, of course, every school has a head boy. And for that, we uh, we welcome Mr. Martin Rothwell, Mike Zero Sierra Golf Lima. Martin, good evening to you. Hope you're well. Good evening. Hey, Dan. Very well, very well. And then the, we've got the person that uh, the note I've got from the normal teacher tells me, this is the one to keep an eye on. You'll probably have to send to the principal's <laughs> office. Mr. <laughs> Leslie Butterfield, Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, sir. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Colin, you, you've no idea how truthful that is. You would be, you would fall off your chair laughing if you knew my school background. Uh, some, some, some listeners may remember many moons ago, myself, Martin, and Leslie, and, and a couple of us done another show for a, a brief period of time. It was a riot and a laugh, and uh, certainly, uh, as I say, I'm looking forward to working with the guys again. But obviously, Bill and Edmund for the first time, so uh, hopefully, we'll have a great show. Well, uh, let's uh, let's let's crack on and have a look at the news stories this episode here, and uh, let's start off with uh, this news story here. This is actually getting traction uh, both sides uh, of the river, I believe, with the AWL and the RSGB, and this is to do with uh, uh, VDSL interference uh, that's happening in the UK. Ofcom and BT's spun-off division, Openreach, are looking at reports of about 150 uh, reported instances of uh, amateurs being affected with uh, VDSL interference. So uh, let's phone this out to the guys and let's get some feedback. And Ma- uh, maybe Martin will start with uh, yourself. And uh, as I say, this is certainly something to worry into uh, the amount of VDSL customers that it could be creating uh, pollution problems. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's lots of different technology out there that cause um, problems for interference for amateur radio and other services for that matter. We've we've had a go about it so many times about uh, these uh, questionable PLT devices that uh, manufacturers seem to be uh, loving. But VDSL, I'll be honest with you, I've got VDSL. I'm running through a VDSL line at the moment. I've not seen any problems as a result of it. I'm aware that my neighbours have got VDSL. I don't personally see a problem from it. But obviously understand that there is uh, something here. The RSGB and, as you said, the ARRL are looking into it. This is just another good reason to join your national body and um, I'm pleased to see that they are actually effectively, I don't want to be rude, but they're pulling their finger out and uh, and uh, looking into it because uh, it could get progressively worse as more and more customers uh, sign on to these servers, perhaps unaware that in some cases the cheap routers that they may be putting online could be causing a problem. 
Yeah, I, I think the essential cheap routers are the issue because when you think about a lot of these uh, brands that are coming out now, even from the major telecoms, you know, a very, shall we say, off-branded modems that are coming out, you know, it makes you just wonder what's involved there. What about yourself, Edmund? Is there, is there much experience down on the uh, the south coast potentially of interference that's being caused by uh, by broadband being supplied over these uh, these copper connections? Well, I have the luxury and I use the word luxury deliberately, of living in a semi-rural area. And there are also no overhead phone lines. They come in underground. So I have been very lucky, and I don't personally suffer from, from this kind of interference. However, I have still filled in the survey to report that, and I would encourage everybody, even if... At the moment, and I emphasize at the moment, that they don't suffer from this interference because just because you don't today doesn't mean you won't turn your radio on tomorrow and find that you've suddenly got S9 plus 30 dB worth of QRM on every band going, which has happened to a friend of mine who lives only a few miles away uh, very recently. So I would encourage everybody to fill in the survey, even if there's nothing to report, because the simple fact that it gets lots of responses could add extra leverage to it um, in Ofcom's eyes because if thousands of radio amateurs respond rather than just a couple of hundred Ofcom might realize then what they would be up against potentially if uh, everybody who responded to the survey suddenly found themselves in the position where they were getting QRM um, it doesn't take long to do it. It's not a five-minute job, but it's not a half-an-hour job either. You don't need different antennas. Use the same antenna all the way through, irrespective of what frequencies it is or isn't resonant on. And uh, make your voice heard, because in this equation, when you've got radio amateurs on one hand and broadband subscribers on the other, the broadband subscribers are always going to outnumber us by definition, so we really need to make our voices heard. Can I ask the obvious question here? What would happen, let's say for argument's sake, we have a valid argument and we put in all these complaints um, and lots of people are proved to be experiencing uh, technical difficulties caused by VDSL. What are Ofcom likely to do about it? Because when off, if Ofcom are going to go up against the likes of British Telecom um, and against the big, I'm not picking on BT, but against the big VDSL suppliers, I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to say, sorry, guys, you've got to take all your equipment out? They're not going to do that, are they? I, knowing these things as they do, I'd say the best you're going to get is a potential fine, and and that will be a lot. And they'll be well, Who's going to get, who's it, going to get but... the fine? The person with a cheap router that got it from his um, supplier in good faith, or the broadband provider, uh, who's using effectively using copper lines for yeah. something that it is not designed to transmit it's the same as plt it's not designed to transmit it it's no. not designed to carry that information is it no true true, true, true. it was you'd have coax you'd have it screened yeah talking about coax and 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 cable bill in in the states i know a lot of people obviously are on um you know cable sort of type connections from what i hear but is, is there much of a market for vdsl in the states and and is this potentially causing a big problem in the states as well from what you can tell Actually, there is a market. Um, I don't believe it's as prevalent of an issue for us. I did some napkin math here looking at the broadband internet providers in the U.S. that are over a million customers in quarter one 2017. And there's actually three, 34 million DSL customers and 59 million cable customers. But when you actually look at, at the what the DSL providers are, they're basically falling into two major bands – most of it is a very DSL light, slower speed, just not even what anyone would consider broadband, just a constant connection, sub one meg. And then the other ones that they're running is they actually looks like some of them have fiber to the houses, and then they run a very small, short run of Cat5 and run DSL over that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not familiar with the fiber ones because I, I installed ISDN and DSL 20 years ago. And it's completely different now. So short runs of copper really, really shouldn't run into too many problems. However, I did snoop around the AWRL website, and they have a, a very nice DSL interference page to talk about not really what you can do about it, but just explaining what, what yeah. happens and what it is with some of the math and stuff. And I, I 
I posted that out there in case you want to tag it on. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's it's I believe it's an issue. I just haven't run into it yet, so I haven't heard of anybody saying, "Oh, I'm getting DSL interference." I've heard of you know a lot of other th things that were causing interference around here, but not not that yet. Yeah. I mean, a lot of long-term listeners will know that uh, you know, we used to record the show in here in Ireland until the internet connection got really uh, atrocious. And uh, a few weeks ago, I had uh, fibre ran all the way here to the house, uh, which has obviously changed things massively. Interestingly, when talking to the uh, installing engineer, he was telling me that in Ireland, the National Telecom here called AIR is uh, proposing to actually remove the copper lines for rural connections and actually run their telephone services using VoIP connections. Uh, which could be quite interesting, um, as I say, for now. But Leslie, heading now to back into into the sort of the London area as well. I mean, I, I know obviously in London you've got a ton of uh, you know a, a ton of other sort of you know uh, interferences and congestions going on. So I mean, it does make me wonder how people are actually picking up this this uh, VDSL interference, if you like, you know, amongst all the other noise as well. What well, can I pick up, pick up on mm. a few things that people have been saying? Because oh. I, I think there's a sort of couple of issues there. The, the first one is the low number of, of formal complaints. You know, there's a big difference about people whinging about noises and this, that and the other. But there, there's actually got to be, from the radio amateurs, when they're getting interference, put a formal complaint in. Because Ofcon don't count whinges. You know, <laughs> there's got to be a piece of paper. And this, this is what they were saying, that there, there is a relative low number of complaints to the users. And the, the only stick if you like you can give the rsgb to to, to, to hit ofcom for them to fill in the interference uh, report request uh, and the rsgb thing they're doing and the other the other thing i've picked up on about as well is it's not necessarily the system but sometimes it's due to poor emc housekeeping attaching things to the box not using feeders uh, and that, if that has sometimes caused problems. But so the, the two is, the couple of things I am trying to say is, A, put a formal uh, complaint into Ofcom, do the RSGB survey, very, very important, because that gives them ammunition, and try and keep the housekeeping, the EMC housekeeping. I have in, co in front of me a copy of Guide to EMC by Robin Page Jones. Now, it's an old book, but some of the things in there I use it all the time, and it, it's very, very good. It is old, but a lot of the thing is still valid today. And the reason we get these problems is because people don't do good housekeeping. Over to you. Yeah, no, good shout, good shout. And remember, guys, we, we only had the news story in the last episode about Ofcom uh, flying engineers uh, sort of, you know, five, 600 miles to go and find out why people couldn't lock their cars with their key fobs. So, you know, Ofcom have the resources, guys. Use them. Uh, in the UK and uh, certainly make the reports and, uh, and make them take action. We'll move on to our next news story here and uh, this is news of a uh, fault in the BBC network that brought down 18 local radio stations uh, that happen around the Oxford area. As I say, so Edmund, I'm wondering because I'm not quite sure if you're quite far enough south to pick up on this problem from uh, that area as well, but it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, the fact is that the BBC with all its networks uh, can be brought down just by one issue. Well, some things never change. 20 years ago, when I was at university, I used to listen to um, BBC Local Radio in the Eastern Counties, and quite often on weekday evenings, they used to present one programme from, I think it was Northampton, between 7 and 10, and then the programme that followed between 10 and midnight would come from Norfolk and the two presenters quite regularly wouldn't be able to hear each other or they'd have switching problems at 10 o'clock and all that kind of thing and this was before the internet came along so I read this story I smiled to myself and thought some things never change but um, it does seem <laughs> very surprising to me that in 2017 um, something like this could happen and I think that most listeners who didn't know better i mean that, that in the news story they mention bbc three counties which is beds hearts and bucks um somebody living in buckinghamshire um, might shrug their shoulders and say well why would a fault or a problem in oxford take my local radio station off the air in the home counties so 
as with all things, always have a backup, always have a plan B, always have a CD that you can stick on and a CD player to put it in just in case everything goes quiet. Just just because we changed the century doesn't mean we changed Murphy's Law. <laughs> Uh, yeah, do you know, I, I was only I was writing something for for somebody else the other day, and I was saying to him, just because we've changed the delivery mechanism doesn't mean the rules <laughs> change. Exactly that same thing, you know. Uh, every everything still appears the same way as you say. I mean, I mean, Leslie, I, I, you know, it, it, it is a remarkable, isn't it? You know, I know they keep saying about oh, we're all going online, we're all going online, but it goes back to this whole thing, and it's single point of failure. You know, these things can be brought yes, down if you yes. don't build in redundancy. Absolutely. This is, I mean, anybody, everybody knows I work on the railways and that's the one thing we keep going. We don't want things that are reliant on one thing. We have, you, you've got to have so much redundancy built in. Yeah. If, if one tiny thing goes wrong, that's it. You know, the whole, not, not on the railways because we've got redundancy, but on ra- radio systems and computer systems, one thing goes wrong and a lot goes down. <laughs> oh, I definitely saw. I mean, I, 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 I don't know, Bill. I mean, any, any way of getting around this? Because the States must have the same problem, I'm sure. The States is probably built on the same sort of infrastructure, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody's sort of liable for this across the world. Well, two things here. First is on the States, almost every uh, broadcast station is automated now. Uh, a lot of them, depending on what generation that they were brought up on automation, they're they're like pre-scheduled, and a lot of times that can be done remotely, and they just kind of run. Uh, a couple other stations, I mean, they're getting uh, satellite down feeds um, from uh, like a master broadcasting station and they just retransmit. But this is actually, this is the second thing is, this is very interesting because I actually went and looked on the history of this. BBC started this virtual local radio station back in 2014 and they have a pretty neat article about it. But the thing that caught us in this with this issue was the, the quote in there. Um, they talked about all the local controls and all the local things you can do at the radio station if something goes wrong, or you can turn on the ISDN, ISDN line and connect back home and that kind of stuff. But in, the system was designed to ensure that only the back end equipment is centralized. So that production teams, this is a quote from that article, production teams can continue to present from the local community just as they do today. Well, that's all well and good, but if you don't have material, <laughs> You, you 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 got nothing you know even it's all on a remote data center somewhere and then and, and they had some connectivity issues and uh they also said in the article that i read that uh, uh bt that's british telecom mm-hmm. uh confirmed the issue was caused by an engineer carrying out pre-work ac- activities in oxford with a fiber tray oops yeah. <laughs> Yeah, redundancy. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 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 Martin, this affected the whole of the UK as well, didn't it? I mean, this was from the south coast right up to the Scottish border. This yeah, was, this I don't, was, I don't uh, think it was well, all covered of them. the whole of the UK, but but there were stations yeah. throughout. You know, as you're dotting up the country, there was, you know, yeah. it was it was from one end to the other of the country. There was there was problems. It was, and these these are all the stations that have effectively subscribed to the VLO service, where they they centralise all their services. They have the, as I understand it, they have the core of the mixing desk up in. Birmingham or somewhere like that, and uh, the mixing desk and everything else is is local, so they are reliant on this connection to their central offices wherever that is. On paper, that's to me that's a great idea. Um, sharing resources, yes, it's great uh, from a cost point of view. Yes, that's great. They say FM, DAB, and AM went silent. Well, the cheeky part of me says, well, DAB, don't worry about that. No one listens to that anyway. But I'm in, in serious dead now. Of, dead of <laughs> yeah. But you know, as we've mentioned before, what about redundancy? One BT engineer in Oxford could break this. Now, okay, that's an impressive faux pas for the BT engineer. But what about running a different circuit? But why is it only on one circuit? What about running it a different way? Probably through a different provider because let's face it, you know, if BT have a problem, you could go via your other provider as well. Some of the comments they made on it: some stations couldn't put musical jingles on the air, so they've just got live mics. Then, right? CD players? Anybody? No one got a CD player anywhere? If you've got the digital studios, great. I can see there's loads of advantages to this sort of stuff. Why wouldn't you have even just a basic analog switch or even an analog mixer in a rack? that you could switch directly to the transmitter, because you know, reading into this, it looks like the transmitters are connected to their central repository. So why wouldn't you just have an analog switch that you could connect, and then at least you can get something on the air? I did actually hear one rumour, and I don't I, I have to stress, I don't know if this is true, but it was rumoured that one studio lost comms back to 
their central offices, which dropped all the presenters off and the local team off, but left a caller on the air that they couldn't disconnect. <laughs> Fortunately, the caller be um, behaved, but I, I do understand that they had to make some changes to the system, shall we say, which, if it does lose a connection, just fades the caller out. Uh -huh. um, but I've heard that from a couple of different BBC people. <laughs> um, so, oh, um, oh, look, Ed, anybody that's worked in any level of, of technology industry will know the reason why somebody went in and sold the solution. Ah, you never need a backup because the ter the, the, the SLA on a service is so great <laughs> and it never it's goes down lines. and it's great and, and no one actually said the no one actually stopped and actually said there was but what happens if it does go down you know yeah, what I mean? and, and with what? radio silence is the only thing that, you know your your airtime audio is the only thing you've got to sell okay you're not selling it but it's the only thing you've got when you get silence. You know, that's when you've got a big problem. People notice two or three seconds of airtime. Hang on, when he hasn't pressed something. Yeah. When yeah. something else goes wrong. When, don't get me wrong, they managed to get Five Live, which is just a national medium wave station, on, onto, onto the transmitter. So there was something there. So they can get the signals to the transmitters. Mm. Like, well, why is everything centralized? Why have you not got some local backup? Yeah. yeah Even yeah. if it is over a domestic cost. broadband line. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all, yeah. All this stuff ends up being cost. And that's yeah. somebody made a decision that's worth the risk to not spend the extra money for Here's these Here's a cheeky idea, then. How, we, they, they recently published um, how much major celebrities or high-earning celebrities on the BBC get paid. How about we look at the ones that are actually any good? <laughs> we'll go with it. Let's have some cost saving, shall we? <laughs> I, I was going to go for more popular ones. I was going to say all these these massively high priced sporting um, events they bid for, which aren't worth the money. How about you actually stop paying the money and put it towards improving your service? Yeah. But I don't get paid anything for doing this. That's true, Leslie. <laughs> and you know, as I've always said, Leslie, you're more than welcome to sharing the losses. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> but going back Wait. to what you were saying about these systems, right, uh, it, they're getting very, very clever, very technically advanced. Now, I, I, I can't repair some of them. And what you, the only thing you can do is you switch the, the on-off switch, the off position, you wait 10 seconds and then switch it back on again. And that's really all you can do today because they they just do their own thing and you can't repair them at all. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but again, it goes redundancy. You know what I mean? There should be redundancy in place. Oh, yes, the yes. Redundancy and, yeah, you I might think there is now. I bet there is. I bet, I bet someone signed the purchase order very quickly after that one. Yeah. Um, I yeah. There'll be some engineer that signed it off originally. And like, like, Does he still work there? Well, I don't know. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think the word gone. career limiting. That that could be where the money came from. Some middle manager got the bullet and they, they took the wages yeah. and bought, bought the backup system. You know, so, yeah. know, we, we jest, we jest. But there you go. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Surely you've got an old modem you could lend them. I I've got a I've got a couple here. I've got a couple <laughs> of bean cam modems that yeah they're ready to go. You know, so uh, <laughs> actually now you talk about that. Have I got a backup internet connection for this? Anyway, different story. Uh, right, okay, guys. Sorry, Connie, we've lost you. Where are you? No, behave, behave. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. Next new story, guys. Uh, be careful. Lock your wallets up and put your credit cards away. There's a chance to spend some money here. Uh, so the no, 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 is... no, 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 no. My, my credit card is zero. It's staying that way. Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> you're fine then. You're fine. Maybe someone might buy one for you. Bill, we've got a chance here to have a dot .radio domain name. So the question is, would you go with a uh, an entry JIX um, uh, dot .radio domain name? Um, not at this point. Not for 30 bucks. When it when it finally falls down in line with like what I'm paying for, you know, regular dot .net, you know, renewals are like eight bucks a year now yeah i could drop eight bucks on a vanity you know domain name but at this point it's like 30 bucks a year well <laughs> i haven't seen 30 dollars for a domain name you know for you know unless you're cyber squatting yeah. for, for years <laughs> and i suppose that's the question edmund isn't it i mean i mean the, the thing is, we've all been told to go out and buy our domain names. We have, a lot of us have got our call signs, .co.uk and .com and .net and all those things. So is, is there any appeal for a .radio domain name, or is this just another instance of the internet finding a way of milking domain name money? Yes. No, yeah. it's not. It's, it's <laughs> not a way of milking domain name money. It's, it's a way of milking your money. <laughs> <laughs> so, Leslie, you, you won't be buying one, I take it? No, I was born in Yorkshire. I'm generous. <laughs> Okay, Martin. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. Let, let, let me just write that down. Hang yeah, on a second. Yeah. Leslie's Leslie. generous. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember that when we're next time we're at a, uh, a social gathering. Just remember, Leslie's generous. Rounds the drinks are on him. Exactly. That's okay. what, so, so, what about you, though, Martin? Would you go for a dot radio? 
Uh, probably not. I mean, we've had dot .fm for, around for a while, and, and I worked years ago. I worked for a radio station that had a dot .fm. It was their name, dot .fm. Yeah. Um, but it was weirdly managed. Like at the moment, with uh, com or dot co uk or whatever, you can just log in and you say, okay, this at my domain dot com um, can point to this, or it you, know, you can set up your own stuff. The dot .fm you had to go through and you had to almost send stuff off and apply for the changes to be to take effect mm. um it wasn't as as easy to manage I, I was short of subscribing to one of these i couldn't tell you how the dot radio works do i really want one probably for my call sign probably not because it's more to type in you know i've, I've got m0sgl.com shameless plug um and you know everybody knows dot com do i want a dot radio no but i can see what it would appeal uh, why it would appeal to people but can people other than radio stations have it? I don't see why not, but ah. it, I think they're aiming it primarily at broadcast radio stations. Yeah, looking at looking at the pricing structure and the policy, it does look like you have to have some sort of radio influence. So there is a price. Oh, it does say S- licensed radio amateurs. Yeah, yeah. So there's, a, there's a price yeah, yeah. for licensed radio amateurs, radio professionals, so your DJ, etc. Now, technically, the ICQ podcast. If we wanted ICQ podcast dot radio, we'd have to pay about two hundred fifty dollars for it, or two hundred twenty euros. Um, Would we for the price of of that domain name? Would got... we though? Because we are all licensed radio amateurs. But... Um, we are technically a radio web radio. Well, I think that technically, as we're a radio, we would have to pay as an internet radio, and there's different pricing depending upon what you are. Okay. So, but the question I is, think we'll stick say, with the well, dot co dot uk and the dot coms. Yeah, yeah, it does the job. It does. The job. I can, I, I can sort of get it. I, I tell you what, I, I think is, I get it for radio stations and internet radio stations, etc. I don't know if individuals need this. I think your call sign is very unique to you. You should be able to get the domain name. You should be able to make a claim on a domain name if it's already taken by saying you've got the right to have that as your brand. Can I, I put the other thing out as well? Mm-hmm. Is a lot of people don't understand. I'm sorry, I'm talking about to the non-techie, to the non-radio people. There is a radio station in London called Thames Radio. It's just a digital radio station, and but their 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 website address is ThamesRadio.London. So they've got a dot London address. Now, when I first saw that, I'm a techie, and I didn't understand the dot .london, like dot .london dot .what. Mm. And so I was sort of expecting, I tried dot .com, dot, uh, co dot .uk, and none of it worked. And then I realized, well, just try dot .london, and it worked. Mm. So I think it will add a layer of confusion to non-techie people. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I mean, look, guys, it's there for you if you want. I, I you. just... I just link. think it's a, it's a bit overpriced. I mean, I, I have a Lycos account, and it cost me half the half the amount of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It, it looks expensive, but again, guys, I'm sure there might be people out there who might be interested in doing that. We've got a link to the uh, the domain name register on icqpodcast.com. Check out. Obviously, make sure your domain name's available. Just because we're not buying ours, please don't buy ours and send it off to a horrible website. <laughs> but uh, I've just registered <laughs> m6boy.radio. Thank you, thank you. I won't even ask where that's going to. And I'm open to bids for it. Exactly, <laughs> open to bids. Yeah, thanks, mate. You know, I, I, knew, I, I knew you'd find a way to make yourself an extra fiver. <laughs> so, so there we go. Okay, next new story here. An interesting website here on uh, real time ban conditions. Quite a nice little simple website here, Leslie. I can yes, see this being quite yes. handy to use on a mobile phone or on, on a on a on a small PC, uh, you know, maybe operating portable. This looks quite an interesting little website. This, it, it's it's is that the Bank Conditions one? This is the one, yeah, bankconditions dot com. I, I've used that before, and it is incredibly easy to use. It uses um, you've got your bands, and it uses a simple traffic light system. And it is is incredibly easy to use. I mean, anyone who's sort of done any work on propagation knows that the mask can get a bit horrible, and you know. But just literally, you can you can look at it and within a second work out what the band is doing. Mm. Uh, it's very very easy to use, uh, and I've used it before when we've had special event stations just plugging about. I've just had a little PC going in the background just to find out which bands are, are working, and I would thor- thoroughly recommend it. Yeah, Edmund, um, would you agree as well? Certainly, very good. I, I could see this being on a a little tablet, a mobile phone, maybe on a on an operating desk out in a in a field somewhere or you know you're operating maybe on a, on a home station be a very handy little system just to see where the bands are isn't it absolutely i used it this lunch time and i gave myself a double shock because if you go to the website www.bandconditions.com 
make sure before you get excited about the data that's displayed in front of your eyes make sure that you've clicked the link at the bottom of the screen for your particular part of the world because even though i'm in the uk <laughs> when i first typed in the website address it thought that i was in america so it gave me a score of 100 which is wide open for 40 meters and i thought oh this is good i wonder why the band's so quiet then and then I clicked on the UK link and the score dropped from 100 to 1, <laughs> which, which, is like, which is like ground wave only, pretty much. Oh, but um, don't be discouraged. I've had a day off work today for the first time in a long time and I've been on 40 metres um, after I put my dipole back up that the, uh, the strong winds very kindly uh, knocked down twice in as many days uh, since the, the weekend. And even though the skip distance was very long, and even though there were lots of big empty spaces on 40 metres, and even though I had to call CQ a lot, there are stations that you can work. You've just got to be in the right place at the right time. It's, it's, so, a, it's, it's another tool in the bag. That, that's the way I look exactly. at it. Just yes, tool, absolutely. But if, to if you see indicate... a score of one for your band... <laughs> Don't just think, oh, well, I won't bother turning the radio on then because it will be completely dead. No, Get on there and call I, CQ anyway. Uh, you do what I do and make a cup of tea and dunk some biscuits. You know. <laughs> or a pork pie. <laughs> the, um, the, the tail on to this, I actually use this uh, Band Conditions website every day. I have it up on the one of my normal tabs I open up in the web browser when I sit down in the shack. It's not based on any kind of software predictions or satellite readings. It's using an ionospheric sounding method called HF ionospheric infantromy. I'm sure I've mispronounced that, which op operates very similar to the pole star system used by NASA. So if you ever want to read something interesting, the, the, the polymetric SAR uh, project running through NASA here in the States it's a fully, I'm just going to read the first line here from it because it's just like, wow. Fully this is polymetric interesting SAR, stuff. Yeah, fully polymetric SAR measurements are subject to the Faraday rotation effect due to suborbital ionospheric total electron content along the radar radio path. And then it just gets complex from there. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's really, I, you know, I started, you know, reading the history about this because I'm like, why is this different than the other things that I look at? Because I have like four or five tabs open. Uh, the other one I use all the time is is the VOCAP prediction or VOACAP. They just upgraded that display and I finally got used to it. It used to have a nice round chart for me. It looked like a clock. Well, now it's, you know, a, a plot chart. and It's... Um, it's very, very, very uh, interesting how multiple pieces of information, you actually get a really good picture of what's going on. And, you know, I always, I always context everything was if you think the band's dead, you know, still call CQ anyway. Um, it, you, you will be surprised. No, I, I'd agree with you. And, and, and you say, I, was it they say there's always loads more people sitting there listening than actually actually calling? So you know your oh, your call sure. could wake the band up when everyone's sitting there, you know, thinking nothing's going on. So I certainly would agree with that. Oh. Um, as the guys mentioned, it's a very simple website, so you've got to make sure you click your your, your location at the bottom. I said there's no sort of sneaky stuff going on trying to find where your location is or your GPS is or sniffing your um uh, your IP address. It's a very simple website, nice and straightforward. And uh, yes, and it updates itself nice and regularly as well. So uh, I have to be honest, so I made the same mistake as Edmund. I was sitting here looking at this thinking, oh, that's good. And as soon as he mentioned, click on the UK, I did that same thing as well. But it's good because it looks at the moment like we've got 80 metres, 40 metres and 30 metres in the UK yeah. absolutely wide open. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not going to switch my radio on and try that because the last time I did that, it sent the audio um, all over the top of the podcast. But it, it, it looks good. Although part of me, because there's no there's no adverts or anything on here, I'm wondering who pays for this. It's, it's a very good website. It looks really really good, but it's the clearly gentleman, someone has yeah the gentleman it. that runs it. I, I remember seeing his call sign on here under the instructions. Oh, he was in there somewhere. Hang on, because there's, there's there's the thing. There's, there's uh, K five B I Z. Okay, and he's in Dallas, Texas. Okay, so clearly this is obviously something that he's uh, he's put on so uh, fantastic well he's uh, done a good job 
Yeah. The other thing I'm going to ask you, obviously, on on even on our, on our own website, we've got the uh, there's a little um, band conditions um, gadget. I wonder how that works in comparison to this one. I know that some of them work along the basis of getting information from the cluster. Be interesting to see how the data compares with what people are putting in the cluster, what that thing on our website is is promoting, and what this is showing compared to what's actually live. It'd be interesting to try the three. Yep. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Indeed, uh, in indeed. Okay, so uh, last new story on our list here, and I, I think this is could be potentially quite important of a news story because we've got here a suggestion that the electric cars uh, could be a greater threat to amateur radio than power line. I mean, obviously, power line has been quite an, uh, an emotional subject for a lot of amateurs, and the flooding that's doing, uh, you know, the emissions and the noise, etc., of those devices. Uh, but certainly now there's a claim that these electronic cars could be the next problem. Bill, probably the states of, of the of the three locations we're in is the leader in, in electronic cars. And I'm wondering if there's any uh, rumblings of this, because uh, this story originates from South Africa, but I'm wondering if, if there's any uh, news that this, this is starting to become a problem in the States, or has this been identified in the States with uh, brands like Tesla, etc.? I haven't uh, heard anything yet. However, I can tell you that... Uh... Uh, I believe it was last year or the year before. Yeah, I think it was last year. Uh, Tesla partnered with one of the national chains of restaurants, and they started putting these charging stations. Um, so they actually put a charging station out at the, our local restaurant here by our large interstate that has so the Tesla cars can back in and hook up and charge, I, I guess, for free. I'm not exactly sure how that works either. But I can tell you from the equipment they put in, the transformers they put in, very, very, very large transformers. So I'm assuming that, you know, anytime you have any kind of large equipment, depending on what kind of quality it is, I, I, I'm sure that these things are ripe for, for interference. I just, just have those transformers on switch modes. No. I don't. Well, with the size of them, I'm, I'm not even sure if that's. Probably not. It, I. Probably not. Um, I, I'll actually have to take some photos and. Next time I'm out there and ship them around on email so you guys can look at them. But it's, you know, they put a nice little fence up to keep you away from the transformers. And, it, you know, it actually it actually looks like a small substation. <laughs> but apparently that's so that they can charge these things real quick. Not really tailing on to the um, electric car rate interference issue. I do want to mention one concern I had was we recently had to evacuate some people in some states here in, in, in the states and I, I really wonder how an electric car, you know, drives, you know, six or seven hundred miles in an emergency with very few charging stations. That's I don't know a good how that point. works. Mm -hmm. um, and I do know from one of the, the student workers that helped me here, he's a volunteer firefighter, and they actually had to get specialized training on rescuing people from a lot cars that have large batteries in them because a you know, lithium batteries are fire hazards, but B, depending on how the collision happens, the vehicle might actually be electrified. Yeah. So he had to have special training on how to rescue people from these vehicles. Very, very interesting whole series of weaving issues with these uh, new electric cars coming out. Mm. I, I, I'm thinking, though, Martin, when we think in Europe, a lot of European governments, if I remember right, I think the UK followed suit with the Germans and the French, and they've set a deadline of combustion engines ending, I think it's 2030. It does make you think what Bill's saying. I think there's diesel, isn't it? They were talking about doing yeah, that, yeah, weren't maybe. they? maybe. But they were talking about the promotion, aren't they, about electric cars and about bringing them on board and all the rest of it. So the question yeah. is, like, is, we're going to need fast charging or some description of these electric cars, as we say, or we're going to have to find something about the batteries and they may go longer. So I, I suppose that the, the layman's logic would suggest that, as I say, these things could potentially be you know, a problem. They, they certainly could. And obviously, if you're going to have to charge your cars, you need the ability to do it quickly. You're going to need effectively large power supplies in order to generate that amount of electricity. I can't think the government have totally thought it through in that sense because if somebody needs to... You, you, you already have parking problems um, in a lot of areas. You can't find somewhere to park. If each parking space then needs a power supply uh, or a way of plugging your car in, that's not going to work very well because a lot of people do park in all sorts of daft places. It's just mean there's less places to park. Equally... Yeah. isn't this just transferring the pollution to the power stations? Is that not just moving all the power station or the, the smoke and the, the fumes and stuff to a power station? Yes. Equally, we already get 
quite a lot of interference from other things. I mean, yeah. I often get noise on two meters in the car when, when certain motorbikes go past me. Motorbikes who, let's, let's be polite, people might be compensating for something with. You know, I quite often get interference on two meters when they go past me. Certain old cars, you hear a chronic um, whine coming across the uh, uh, from the car. Is it going to get worse than electric cars? Probably. I think this goes back to the first subject we we were talking about, and it's a, it's about collecting the information. Then the national society is getting involved, and when they've got the information from the radio amateurs, using that using that collective information to to put pressure on the regulators and say, here, these products are causing problems. But the trouble is, but, when they're out there, they, it's very difficult to change it. Well, we had this discussion know, on the last three four three three point nine two. They're not going to change yeah. that, but that's the, that's really what they should be doing. Yeah, uh, but with, without that, without that data, we haven't Can't got anything it, in yeah. our hands. But you then, know, by, this... by which time, it's it's too it, late, it, and it, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's out there. It's, uh, I think it's called a, a barn door open. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, I I just see this as being but, another one of those um, those problems again. You know, they're, they're solving one issue by deciding, okay, we all. We want to move combustion engines. We want to move to electric cars. We want to do this sort of stuff, and then they don't realise the other problems they're 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 knocking along the way. I mean, I mean, probably Edmund yourself and I, where we live, I mean, a bit more rurally, etc. This is going to be less of a problem for us until obviously we go into to towns or we find out that I don't know, say our next door neighbour has a has an electric car installed and gets somebody who's not qualified to go and put a, an electric charge point in for him and then creates all sorts of interference. And it does make me wonder if there's any real regulations on this to actually uh, protect against interference. Yes, I could see the charging side of it creating more interference than the driving side of it. I mean, my own car, which is uh, runs on unleaded, all I need to do is turn the ignition on and the built-in sat-nav screen lights up. And uh, if I then tune across, probably on HF, I don't really do HF mobile, but certainly on VHF and UHF, there's all kinds of, um, of uh, spurious signals here, there and everywhere. So, um, yeah, I, I don't really know what to add, to be honest, uh, Colin, beyond what's uh, already been said, other than that I could see the, the charging side of it being the, the big th- the thing that causes the big problem rather than just people driving them along the road. They need to come up with some kind of regulation, I think, to say you may not cause interference, and if you are causing interference, or if these products are causing interference, they must be removed, that sort of thing. I know that there are, there are FCC regulations on equipment that does that. I think the same sort of thing should apply to you know, cars as well. I did read somewhere that there was there was someone talking about having a particular area of a band that certain things could operate in that they could cause interference to. Um, the cheeky side of me says, could we make that 218 to 220 megs DAB area? No, I'm just being cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to notice. Exactly. Well, the other thing I just wanted to mention, guys, is, is we haven't mentioned the hurricane that um, that hit the Florida area, the states in the Caribbean, pretty much because we're about a week, obviously, behind on release of the show. But obviously, uh, I'm sure my colleagues here will join me by saying our uh, thoughts with anybody that's been affected with it. And obviously, we wish good health and uh, great, uh, uh, say, success to the uh, members of Aries and uh, similar groups and uh, obviously helping people out through that disaster uh, through the Caribbean and uh, and into Florida there. So uh, I'm sure we, we all concur with that. As I say, our thoughts were obviously with you guys, but I say our, our record schedule, I say, is going to make this as though it's uh, sort of an old news story by the time we, we come round to it. But uh, certainly, I say, yeah, we, we appreciate everything you've done from the Aries side of these guys. And so hopefully your families are safe, etc. Um, and so not too much damage done there. Well, let's do a quick round up. I, I understand this is something that Martin does, so we uh, we better keep tradition. Edwin, let's start with yourself. And uh, anything interesting you've been up to since your last appearance on the show that you uh, you may wish to share with the class? Well, my last appearance was uh, quite a long time ago now, because on the uh, the week that I should have been making an appearance, I was actually at a planning meeting for the local radio club, which, by happy coincidence, coincided with the club's annual barbecue, and that was a planning meeting for the International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend. Um, So I camped out at my local lighthouse. I think from memory we worked uh, uh, Chris Howard, um, who can't be with us tonight. He mentioned on the last show that he worked you, yes. Yeah, 
So that was good because uh, 2017 was the 20th anniversary of the, the Lighthouse Weekend in its current form. It does have roots going back a bit further than that, but this is the 20th year that it's been in the form that we recognise it today. So I wanted to do something a bit special, so I camped down there for the whole weekend. There were no major disasters or problems or anything like that, apart from me getting woken up at 3 o'clock on Saturday morning by what sounded suspiciously like two gunshots. And uh, one of the other people camping down there heard them as well. But I'm pleased to report that nobody got shot. <laughs> well, <laughs> did you find out what that was all about? Or <laughs> no, no, that is an enduring mystery. So if I do it again next year for the 21st edition, then uh, I'll have to to find out. So that was very successful. Haven't really done much amateur radio since then, except that the week that is in progress at the moment is the international air ambulance week the final day of that is the day that this podcast is released um so if you are listening to this on the day of release hf has been very difficult so for the final day the sunday i'm going to get myself up onto some high ground somewhere and uh, hopefully will be heard on uh, vhf widely across Sussex, Surrey, Kent, London, Essex maybe on uh, 10, 6, 4, 2 and 70 SEMS vertically polarised FM, maybe a bit of SSB so Mm -hmm. if you're around on Sunday have a listen there are other um, stations taking part in this as well and then after that the only other thing on the horizon is my debut appearance at the Newark Ham Fest at the very end of September yeah, and uh, I, I hear you have an orange T-shirt ready to go as well. Um, I do, yes, and I'm going to look really stupid if I forget to bring it with me, so I will do my best <laughs> to remember to remember to pack it amongst all the other things that I will doubtlessly be bringing with me. We need to uh, text you the day before and remind you. Yeah, I'll have a badge on, and I'll, knowing me, I'll probably have a handheld on uh, 145 decimal 500, so... If anybody's at near it wants to put a call out on uh, on the calling channel, I will talk to anybody um, <laughs> if they if I hear them. And uh, just one final, final, final thing: if you want to have a good laugh at me at uh, at my expense, um, I'm not overly um, computer literate. And you know, earlier in the podcast, we mentioned that uh, radio stations could uh, apply for um, websites that end in dot fm. Yep. Like, yep. For, like for frequency modulation. Well, I'm aware that Ofcom has recently licensed a couple of new stations around here. There's one on test in Brighton uh, at the moment on the on the FM band. And a couple of months back, I noticed whilst I was doing the school runs and driving around that I was starting to see vans with names on them that I didn't recognise and website addresses that ended in .fm. So I thought, oh, okay, these must be um, company vehicles for these new stations that are coming online. Are they facilities management but, companies? Ah, you, yes, you beat, you beat me to it. <laughs> but I've, I've looked, looked at the roof and thought, well, there, there aren't you know any masts or antennas or anything about it, and it's it would be an odd name for a radio station anyway. I can't remember what it was. And as I don't you know, write, we have some odd ones anyway. As, as you rightly say, eventually, after a couple of months, the penny finally dropped that in this context, dot .fm didn't stand for frequency modulation. It stood for facilities management. <laughs> uh, so if you want to have a, a good laugh at, uh, at my expense, then feel free. Don't, don't. We're all guilty of that one. We're all guilty of that one. For I think I had a similar experience. I looked at that. I think that's an interesting name for a radio station. And it, it wasn't even their website address. It was just listed on their on their on the side of their vans. Oh, that's an interesting name. Wonder where that comes from. Well, yeah, facilities management. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Bill, stateside there. Uh, what's been going on since your last appearance? Quite a bit. I actually had uh, a few few things because it's it's been what a month since since I've been on the call last. Oh, yeah. I can or yeah, something like that, or a month and a half. Because I know I had to work during the last time we were recording, so it's been a while. So I had to go back and look at you know a few things that happened. Well, starting at you know January first, there's a tradition every year you make some New Year's resolutions, things that you want to do. 
I usually, you know, do things like, you know, stop drinking so much, stop, you know, lose some weight, you know, stop drinking so much coffee and all that kind of stuff. And those things go out the window about the third of January or whatever. Well, this, <laughs> this year I said, I'm going to do three soda activations before, you know, January 1st, 2018. And I finally got the first one done. Hooray for me. Yes. And it was completely unplanned, which is hilarious. So I I always pack up my stuff and throw it in the back of the car when I go up to the in-laws because if if the kids are playing and 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 things are, you know, not going on or you know, I I go outside and sit on their picnic table and I, you know, set up the KX3 and you know, do work some radio and stuff for a little bit. Well, there was a real lull and they wanted to do some stuff and I, you know, pulled up my little map of what soda of summits are nearby. Whiskey 3 Papa Oscar 008 Mount Pisgah Mountain was 15 minutes away. So I'm like, hey, can I disappear for an hour? And, you know, my Mrs. B's like, yeah, okay. So I jumped in the car, drove up the mountain, hiked a little bit to the summit, and did my first soda activation. And I worked like five stations because the bands were dead because that's what usually happens when you, you know, (laughs) want to go do a soda activation. That's when the, you know sun starts puking out x-rays so that was very exciting so i got that done and i posted a few photos i worked vk5 uh po on 30 meter ft8 which you know once again for the time of day and the band conditions i felt it was i was shocked that i got a vk5 so i always wanted to uh share that with it with everybody just so they understand just because the band's kind of dead you might get those itty bitty little micro openings of a few minutes um, so call CQ, you never know. And then about a month and a half ago, there was a quite a bit of a discussion about doing a satellite QSOs bef- before the 10th anniversary next year. Done. <laughs> I did, I did three satellite QSOs on AO 85. Um, I guess it was two weeks ago from here at work. Uh, NA2AA, NJ4Y, and KC3GFZ. Um, my home grid square, which is, you know, just a few miles down the road, not really rare. Um, this grid square, Fox Nancy 11, apparently for satellite work is relatively rare. And, uh, Matt, who was, you know, successfully made it through the hurricane, according to his Twitter feed, he's from Florida and, and J4, N, J4, Y. And he's just like, Hey, I need your grid square. I'm like, Okay, <laughs> so we set up a sked, and I got on AO85 for the first time. Now, this was my first FM QSOs on satellites. I did uh, SSB ones back in the 90s where it was VHF up and 10 meters down, and it was like you do upper sideband up, and it came down and lower sand, or it, it flipped it. I can't, you know, I'm, I, it's so long ago. I, I don't remember the exact specifics other than, you know, they were like AO7 and 8. That's how long ago it's been. <laughs> now they're up to 85. Um, so anyway, it was my first uh, FM satellite QSO. So that was kind of exciting. And then I'm not going to be Rare DX next week, but I am ju- island jumping next week for the vacation with um, um, the Mrs. and I are celebrating our 10th anniversary and we're actually going to the islands. Not taking any radios along because it's the first island jumping. I'm not sure what I'm going to run into yet, but it's going to be fun so I can at least scope the area out for maybe a future, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and congratulations on the, on the 10th anniversary. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, so you'll be island hopping over next uh, next weekend. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say good luck in leaving the radios behind. I know it'd be uh, always difficult to leave a radio behind, but uh, good luck. Um, who we got next? So let's go, Leslie. Leslie, what have you been up to the last oh! couple of weeks? You're, 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 you're recovering at the moment, aren't you, sir? You've, you've had some success. I am. I am. I've, um, I've been under the knife. It, 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 you know, but when you're getting old, bits, bits don't work anymore. So it's, it's sort of a, not repairs on radio. They've had repairs on me. But hey, we're getting better. It, it's all good. It's all good. Um, what have I been doing? Well, because I've been at home. You know all those projects you put, you have an idea, and then you put, buy the bits and pieces, and you put them in the cupboard, and you say, one day I'll get round to that. 
Well, that's what I've been doing. A <laughs> um, couple of them, I'll touch at the first one. I had a little Mizu 3.5 megahertz handheld that are full of crap and gunk. And I thought, I've got to get that working. And I thought I cleaned it all up and we tried it down the club. And that was a load of palaver. It was sort of on on 80 meters somewhere. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a VFO crystal con, uh, controlled handheld. No longer in production, but we managed to get that up, that up and running um, and all cleaned up, and that's all good. Um, other little projects we've been working on, there's a little crystal calibrator I, I bought off eBay, which works an absolute treat. And we've dug out some little house boards that I had in the cupboard, and there's a little 80-meter transceiver uh, that's, that's next on my list. I've got to get the bits for that, but the board's already made. It just went in the cupboard. But now it's out there covered, and those are the next things. So yeah, I've I've been incapacitated, but that, does that mean I'm, I've I've not done anything? No, I've been busy, been been busy doing amateur radio as you do. Exactly. It's, you know, it sounds one of those ones where you've got an opportunity and uh, and grateful to take it. You know, so I hope you enjoy the time there. Uh, Martin, what about yourself? Uh, what have you been up to the last uh, week or so since uh, your last appearance on the show? Is yeah, on the last episode. Um. Bit of a D star. I had a couple of uh, really good conversations up on there. I've uh, been playing with uh, Fusion. Of course, I look after the local uh, Fusion repeater, so uh, do pop up on there just to make sure that uh, everything there is uh, working okay as it should do. Been a bit with Whisper. Had a bit of a uh, play with that. So the uh, a lot of the HF bands have been fairly quiet. So I thought, well, isn't I can't hear anybody talking on them, so I'll try Whisper. And uh, five watts. I got Australia, Japan, and um, the east coast of America. Um, all on one transmission, so uh, I'm quite happy with that. Yeah, the uh, the bands are completely dead, aren't they? Um, I've also been playing with a little SDR I got uh, for my birthday. Um, not a fun cube dongle. Uh, it's sort of similar to an RTL device, but uh, not quite. I think. Been the uh, playing with some decoding, some data. Going to go and have a uh, have a go at building a weather satellite antenna. I heard the satellite, uh, the data coming down as the satellite went overhead, but uh, obviously I'm using a vertical antenna, so it doesn't really hear it properly. Um, I wasn't able to do anything with that, so uh, I went to uh, look to buy some copper pipes to have a go at building the antenna, and uh, I did get some strange guys, strange look from the guys in the plumbing shop um, when I was trying to explain to him what I wanted. He let, so you're not going to plumb with it? And let no, I'm going to turn it into an antenna. He gave me a bit of a funny look, but uh, they just say with those pipes, I might uh, have a go at uh, building an arrow antenna too. The parts from that, so uh, just to see how that goes. And uh, I'm very jealous of Bill now, having uh, worked on an FM satellite. I need to have uh, I need to have a go at that, and uh, so we mentioned on the podcast uh, uh, a little while ago that there was a, a D Star satellite up there. I don't know if he's up there yet. We talk about the launch, whenever it is. The D Star satellite. Um, I want to have a go at that. So uh, that's uh, it's sparking my interest, and um, of course we're off to Newark again in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, very much looking forward to uh, to that as well, and uh, meeting some of our listeners again. Exactly. Hope. We've got... Tacking on to what Martin's just mentioned, yeah. can I just jump in here quick? I just want to remind everybody the directions I used to get on AO85 was the directions that you guys talked about on a previous podcast and have links out on the ICQ podcast website. It's a simple one pager. You know, the first side tells you just general AMSAT satellite stuff. The back side tells you exactly what you have to do to, you know, hold a handheld antenna and, and work the satellite so what you're saying bill is that we can't go and ask anybody else for help we've now got to go back and listen to our previous episode to find out what we told people <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, no it's not what i'm saying but i'm implying <laughs> it's really really easy and there's the directions were really really good um i always you know in general i i, I i'm always really critical of directions that people give you because a lot of times the stuff they give you they're missing steps or they're missing they're missing something you need to know to magically glue everything together. That sheet was really good, and that's why I always call it out, because it's rare that you see a really good one-page directions on how to do something. Yeah, I'd like to go and print that off. Exactly, exactly. Right, guys, as, as Martin mentioned, uh, myself, Edmund, Martin, the other Martin, the, the Skyver tonight who can't turn up, uh, and uh, Chris Howard, we'll all be at Newark. Orange T-shirts at the ready. Feel free, come along, say hello. Let us know what you think, etc. And uh, buy a just cup of coffee, check. biscuits. That's fine. Uh, yeah, cup, a cup of coffee and, and Snicker bars are always well, well appreciated. As I say, so, so feel free to see New York. All that's left to do is me to thank uh, tonight's panel. So I'd like to thank uh, Bill Barnes, November three, Julia India X Ray, 
Martin Mike Zero Sierra Golf Lima, Leslie Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, and Edmund Mike Zero Mike November Golf. Thank you guys for uh, for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Seventy three. It's been a blast. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now we have a look at the news in brief from me, Colin M6BOY. As mentioned there at the end of the news round table, a lot of news stories uh, over the last fortnight have been in relation to the hurricanes in Florida, which obviously by now are uh, a little bit old news. So, uh, But we're focusing on some good news in Kenya to start off with, with the 60 metre allocation being given there. Uh, the Kenyan Radio Society uh, has stated that their regular, the CAK, the Communications Authority of Kenya, has given them a 60 metre allocation between 5275 kilohertz and 5450 kilohertz on a secondary basis. All modes are permitted with a maximum power out of uh, 400 watts of PEP. Uh, so good news there. And we put a link on the ICQ podcast website to the Kenya National Frequency uh, Allocation Band Table for you to check out. The European Amateur Radio Organization have announced a new party on the air, and this time with the motto of DMR Meeting on the Air. Uh, this is a meeting rather than a contest, and it's a way of basically just exchanging and communicating contacts over using DMR. There's a uh, few simple rules, which we've got a link to on the ICQ podcast website, um, let's say just to make everyone's life enjoyable. The event will take place over the uh, weekend of the 23rd and 24th of September uh, 2017. And just a reminder as well, the ICQ Amateur Ham Radio podcast will be attending the UK Ham Fest event at Newark at the end of October. Uh, so uh, your team will be there. Uh, myself, uh, both Martins, Chris Howard and Edmund Spicer will be there uh, wearing our orange t-shirts, etc. Feel free to come along, say hi, say hello, etc. Um, if you have any uh, feedback for us, notes, etc., feel free to pass them on. We'd be more than happy to uh, engage you and have a chat to you about the show and certainly find out what you enjoy about the show and uh, receive any feedback. So feel free to say hi. Uh, as I say, and, uh, say, tell us what you think. Well, now we head over to our features episode, which is Martin MNLB's feature in regarding trying 60 meters and using the Soto Beam band hopper antenna. I hope you enjoy, guys. And now, what you've all been waiting for this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Hi guys, for this episode's feature I wanted to talk about 60 metres. Now if some of you have been on 60 metres, you know how good it is. For people like me, who'd never been on 60 metres until recently, I often thought, hey, you know what, it's going to just be too much trouble, I can't be bothered, I've got to do modifications to the rigs, I've got to build myself an aerial, and I was being lazy. Let's be brutally honest, I was being lazy. And I thought, well, what's the point of just having a few spot frequencies and chances are they won't uh, correspond with somebody else in a different part of the world. So I kind of dismissed it as something that I was interested in but not going to make the effort to have a go at. This all changed a, a few weeks back and Richard at Soto Beam sent us a uh, antenna when he said, you know, guys, have a, have a look at this, see what you think. So we had a look at uh, Richard's band hopper antenna, and he's brought out a new one, uh, which is the their MIDI hopper, which is, covers bands 20 metres, 40 metres and 60 metres. Well, good choice, Richard, because now I have an antenna for 60 metres, I suddenly think that I want to try 60 metres out. Now, once again, I said I was lazy and hadn't got around to doing it, I mean, I believe that the uh, 60 metre band has been around in various shapes and forms for the best part of five or six years around the world. Now, a lot of countries have different uh, frequencies. Some are now trying to standardise on the WRC15 recommendation. Some countries are allowed hundreds or hundreds of watts. Others are only allowed 25 so it's kind of a little bit of a mismatch at the moment. But I've now got the antenna to try. Then I went, oh, hang on. I've just bought an FT450D. This should uh, actually do 60 metres. So I'll have a quick look in the box. And 
Sure enough, switch mine on, and it don't do 60 metres. That's a UK version, it doesn't do 60 metres, and in the UK, that particular radio gets programmed with the uh, frequencies into memory. It's uh, hard-coded into memory, but mine hasn't got it. So I start scratching my head and looking for a fight and one thing or another. And I was talking to Mr. Chris Howard, and I looked all over the internet for this. And he suddenly says to me, ah, oh, there's a bit of information on the dealer site, dealer's website. And it didn't actually say 60 metres from what I recall, but downloaded this little file, uh, powered off the radio, hold two buttons down, powered it up, and it came up and you had to change a menu setting, probably one of the hidden menu settings from uh, three to four. And suddenly my radio's now got 60 metres, so I'm a happy bunny. So I've now got a radio, I've now got an aerial. What am I going to do? Well, I need to obviously start thinking about uh, the different things that are happening on uh, on 60 metres. So, need to find out the differences, the differences around the world. Now, my radio has seven spot frequencies. If it had been an American uh, Yaesu FT450D, it would have had five and slightly different frequencies. But, all in all, uh, I, I got mine, so I was quite happy. The power levels, as I say, can change different parts of the world. Depending on your licensing conditions, you're allowed different power levels. And the frequencies that you're given, a number of them, uh, some are set for CW only, some are multi-mode. The interesting one with 60 metres is that it's all upper sideband, which is quite strange because we always said, and we always tell beginners that all frequencies are lower sideband and all frequencies above 10 megahertz are upper sideband. There we have suddenly now a band down at 5 megs and it's upper sideband. So that's the first catch you if you're not to, if you're going to just get a shortwave radio and start listening down there to see what's going on. You need to uh, check out your licensing requirements. Um, certainly in the UK, you have to be a full license holder to be allowed to use 60 metres. Uh, an intermediate and foundation wouldn't be allowed to do that. So kind of what I will say is wherever you are and whatever country you're in, check your licensing. And remember, some countries have adopted channelized, Others have adopted the new WRC15 uh, block of frequencies and allow you to uh, tune through them. But I say I'm lucky at the moment in some ways in that... Um, my radio is set on the spot frequencies for the UK, and the UK hasn't adopted WRC15 yet, so uh, we'll carry on that way. So I suppose the big question for others doing a similar thing is, will your radio support 60 metres? Well, I suggest you have a good look in the operating manual and see if it mentions 60 metres or 5 megs. It may say, like mine did, that it's uh, installed into memories, and hard code into memory locations, that's that's a good option. Or you may have to modify your radio. Now, if you go in and modify your radio, I'm taking no responsibility for your actions. You do this off your own back. However, there are a number of sites on the internet that tell you how to modify all sorts of rigs to allow them to operate on either 60 metres or you totally wideband the radio and it operates through the whole of the uh, HF bands, uh, including the, the ones we're not supposed to transmit on. But, as I say, you have to take your own responsibility for that. If you modify your rig and you damage it, it's your fault. If you operate out of band, it's your fault. I'm not taking, I'm not taking the responsibility for you on that one. But once you've got a radio that's modified and can work on 60 metres, you're ready to get started. So what do you need to get on the air? Well, come back to, you need the radio that will operate on 60 metres, pretty obvious really. An antenna for 60 metres. And once again, I come back to check your licence. Now, we decided to uh, give this antenna from Soda Beams a try. And I've been out a couple of times with it. Once I went out with Chris Howard, M0TCH, and we put up the antenna, uh, it was towards the end of the day, 
the radio my radio wasn't working on 60 meters at the time and i tried it out on 20 and 40 and it worked uh, extremely well worked okay worked um, a good few countries around europe in the configuration richard shows on his website more of that in a minute the second time i went out i decided that colin was over from ireland and we'd go out and play radio and unfortunately it was a bank holiday monday now i must have uh, had a screw loose when i decided to do this because bank holiday monday i'm guessing not a lot of amateurs are going to be around they're going to be doing family things so there we are colin and i get up early enough and we trundle off to epsom downs which is about four or five miles from where i live big open space and I wanted to try setting up this antenna, this band hopper antenna, the way that Richard shows it on the website. So there's a nice video that uh, on Sotobin's website that Richard shows. Now the first time I did it, I did it with Chris, and there was two of us. And let's be brutally honest, if there are two of you, it makes it a lot, lot easier to put up. But I knew it could be done by one person because it's in Richard's video. Now. I wouldn't say I was as quick as Richard, and I wouldn't say I was as expert as Richard. But in fairness, that was only my second attempt. For future attempts, I'm sure I get much, much quicker. And I'm sure that uh, Richard had done a number of setups before he videoed it. But, you know, it does go up the way he says it does. So there we were. I arrive at Epsom Downs. I install the antenna. And I get it up and, it, and I get various people come over asking me what I'm doing and we explain that uh, we're an amateur radio station and we're playing for the morning and off they go. Uh, so we we antennas up, I'll get the table and chairs out, the battery out, the radio out and we put the radio on the, on, on the, the table and the switch on and I think in for a penny, in for a pound. So I pick a couple of frequencies that are supposed to be uh, SSB frequencies and I put a couple of calls out and nothing. And I'm thinking, okay, it's early in the, it's about 10 o'clock UK time, local time, so it'd be 9 o'clock UTC. And I'm thinking, maybe we, we will get a contact in a minute. So I try out another frequency. I put a call out and instantly I get a gentleman come back to me. Now, I nearly fell out of my chair. This gentleman came back to me. It was like an FM contact. All right, he was only 60-odd uh, miles away, about 60 miles away. But it was absolutely armchair copy on SSB. I don't think I've heard an SSB contact as, as good as that one. I had a good chat with uh, the gentleman, Mike. I had a good, very good chat with him, and... You know, I was really impressed. Then when I, when I finished having a chat with him, I was called by another station that uh, was uh, out in Kent about another 40, 50 miles the other direction. And, yeah, you know, it, it continued like that. Martin Rothwell, M0SGL, tells me that 60 metres is like uh, 4 metres. He says a gentleman's band and people like to have a chat well, I've got to say, that was pretty much the way it was. I worked six contacts, and uh, if anyone want to see who they were, they're in my log on uh, qrz.com. But they're all UK, and I accept that, because the antenna I put up, this band hopper antenna, I put it up in MVIS configuration. Furthest contact was into Scotland, Edinburgh, which will be a good 450 miles from where we were. So, in fairness, I would suggest that my signal was coming down in a, in a radius of about 450 miles. So, it was pro probably would have been intercontinental as well, over onto the continent, France, Germany, Belgium. But uh, I was more than happy to do my various contacts around the UK, being a starter. Now, while we were doing that, the general public popped along, which is always good. They managed to uh, explain some what we were doing. And they, they get very impressed and they go, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it was quite nice because uh, I had some sensible questions from some of them. But uh, certainly worked well. So 
Would I recommend people having a go at 60 metres? Well, quite honestly, yes. Um, I'm now looking up the modifications to do to a couple of my other rigs to get them onto 60 metres because I want to have another go at this. And um, I, as I say, it works very, very well 60 metres. The bandhopper antenna that Richard lent us from Soda Beams, great little antenna. That worked extremely well. Yes, you can get it up and working uh, with one person. And the whole situation, the whole thing we took out on, su on Monday morning to do this uh, quick bit of operating was probably the least amount of gear I've taken in my car to go out and do operating on HF. All I had was the radio, a fishing pole, one of these fiberglass fishing poles, a handhopper antenna from soda beams, and a battery, table and chairs, a pencil and paper. And away we went. And that just worked so well. So I was very, very pleased. So would I suggest you have a look at it? Well, yeah, of course I would. Um, more people on 60 metres, the better. Uh, there are some modifications from some of the manufacturers coming through. Yesu in particular have uh, modifications coming to their firmware for, for certainly a number of their rigs. And as I say, if you wanted to get on 60 metres, certainly have a look and see what's going on out there and how to modify. If you're unhappy of doing it yourself, take it into a dealer and ask them to do it. Uh, that way it doesn't void your warranty. I hope that's been of interest to you. And maybe I'll catch you on 60 metres. 73. <laughs>and it always makes him smile when the female voice ends her uh, uh, jingle statement. That uh, that lady's voice is uh, Emma, who's uh, Marty Ruffwell's uh, fiance, and uh, we keep threatening to ask her to do some more uh, um, jingles for us. So we must get round to writing those and asking uh, Emma to record those for us because she does a great job on those, doesn't she, Dad? Yeah, yeah, she certainly does. And, and I'm going to embarrass her if she ever listens, but she, that, that, I know what he means. It's that sexy sigh at the end. It's kind of just a sigh at the end of one of the the jingles that really sort of think, hmm, yeah, that's different. So I'm glad we kept that one in, Colin. And uh, Emma's a lovely lady. I saw her a couple of weeks ago with Martin. So that was good. Yeah, no, no, so. Um, and then we've got a, a mail in from Dave, Mike Zero, uh, Tanga Alpha Zulu. Um, and he just wants to make a small correction for us. He, he's a, he's a long time listener to the show, enjoys the show greatly. Um, but he wants to just pick up on something that was mentioned in the last episode. Um, I think we were making mention in relation to the news story, uh, about the gentleman, the M6, who was helping, um, rescue someone who became in distress and was alerting the emergency services. And there was a comment made by one of the contributors about being able to dial uh, the emergency services in a mobile phone that doesn't have a SIM card. By all accounts, that's now been changed uh, due to a lot of hoax um, calls, which is a, a real shame that that's the case. But you, so you need to have some type of SIM in the phone um, for it to actually work uh, on the uh, on the UK networks, certainly. Um, which I think that's a bit unfortunate, but at the same time, I suppose it's the usual thing. The, the behaviours of others uh, affect things for everybody else, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, certainly does, certainly does. But I suppose the old saying, when all else fails, amateur radio doesn't. So, uh, you know, take your handy talkie with you. It's uh, very, very useful to have with you at any time when you're out and about. I must admit, I keep one in the uh, door pocket of my car. And uh, when I'm out and about, or if I go out for a wander, I just take it out of the door pocket and away it goes. And I must check the charge on it now. Usually it's pretty good. It doesn't run down. Uh, but if you do have a handy talkie in the car, um, check it from time to time. The battery hasn't run down. You don't want to get caught out. Yeah, very true, very true. Well, it was a, certainly a very enjoyable episode and certainly very enjoyable helping you uh, test the uh, soda bean band hopper antenna there as we were trying the 60-metre uh, the 
uh, band any other week on Epsom Downs. Uh, we'll have some uh, a few po- pictures. Uh, they're already posted to the Facebook group, but we'll put those up on the website as well uh, of what we were doing there at that day. Um, certainly a, a very impressive, simply well-designed piece of kit there uh, from Sosa Beams. And uh, uh, I know something certainly that made our our life very enjoyable there for the few hours we were operating on Epsom Downs before we got flooded by the horse racing goers. Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. And uh, as I said in the feature, it was probably one of the um, smallest amounts of kit that I've ever taken to go out and play HF. Uh, just an antenna, a radio, a battery, table and chairs, and a pen and paper. So, uh, and away we went. Mm-hmm. That was great. Yeah, exactly. And, and those contacts were, most of them were very, very crystal clear, as you say, you know, and, uh, and, and certainly very enjoyable. So, uh, yeah, look, look, it, it was a good, a good experience. Uh, we'll obviously pop links to the Soto Beam antenna on our website if you're interested to find out more. Uh, as I say, and I know that the Soto Beam skies will be up at, uh, at Newark. Uh, for the Hampshire, we appreciate uh, the uh, Richard Soap Beans passing on the uh, the trial demonstration kit for us. Uh, as I say, if you check out the ICQ podcast website about get involved, you'll see the rules about we we have about uh, taking the demo kit. Uh, you know, we are allowed to review it on face value. We get no financial inducement for it, etc. And that's certainly the case. And Richard knew when he sent that down to us that, uh, as I say, we would review it as is. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Richard, for doing that. And we'll be returning that antenna back to you uh, at Newark in a couple of weeks' time. Well, as always, guys, we'd ask you to keep in touch with us. Uh, usual methods, obviously, visit the ICQ Podcast website, icqpodcast.com. Feel free to check out the donation page while you're there. Anything you can send away is always greatly appreciated. The Facebook group is also getting close to hitting 500 members. We'd really be grateful if we can get to that number soon. As I say, and that's uh, an opportunity for you to share news and information with uh, the people in the community, along with find out the latest information on the Amateur Radio News. You can also do that by signing up for the website's e-newsletter or by following us on Twitter. Our Twitter handles are at Colin Butler and at M1MRB. And we try and post as much as we can throughout the two weeks between the two episodes. Signing up to the newsletter could be quite a good idea because um, not only the newsletter but the Facebook groups we will be publishing how we're going to be communicating about the Newark Hamfest. We're going to be trialling live blogging while we're at Newark Hamfest uh, this uh, year. And I say obviously we need to get the links out to you to let you know what we're up to so you can see what's going on over the two days of Newark Hamfest. So make sure, say, you're on those um, email news lists and the Facebook group, the Twitter feed, etc. so you can pick up on the links that you'll need to find those uh, those live blogs we'll have on the icqpodcast.com website. And again, we've mentioned you a few times throughout the episode. Make sure you come along and say hi. Uh, we always enjoy having a chat with everybody along the way. So I think what we need to do now is to thank our panel in this episode for the, uh, on, on the round table. Martin Ruffell, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Leslie Butterfield, Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Bill November 3, Juliet India Foxtrot, and Edmund Mike Zero, Mike November Golf. I think that just about wraps up everything apart from sending you off to make a cup of tea, Dad. Yeah, certainly. I will in a minute. But what I want to say to all of our listeners is thank you very, very much for your downloads. Uh, trust me, we do appreciate every, every one of them. And uh, although Colin stepped in for me this uh, episode because uh, I was uh, totally zonked out, uh, we do appreciate and we do these for you because we, we enjoy them. So uh, thank you very, very much for your downloads from all of the team. And, uh, yeah, I'm off now to make Mrs. B a cup of tea before she gets in from work. I think I ought to find her a biscuit because she's had to put up with me being uh, totally uh, worn out for the last few days and uh, not being very sociable. So uh, I'm off to do that now. So don't forget, guys, we'll do it all again in a fortnight's time. 73. We sure will, guys. 73. Bye-bye.